This is Herman, and Herman is an anxious dog. I can tell that he has cortisol in his blood, by the way, that he has what we call efficiency of movement. He snaps his head around. There's any little sound, he barks and freaks out and runs. Uh, him and his partner uh, think that they run the show here. And so, uh, yes, I just told them that. And so basically, uh, he has cortisol in his blood, I think, because he's stressed. He thinks that his guardians are putting themselves in dangerous situations. They don't listen to him, and that stresses him out. And he, that burden of responsibility has created pressure, uh, and that leads to stress, and now he's nipping. So, and then we also have the dogs that are doing a little redirected aggression towards each other. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to teach a dog to focus in a way that actually can reduce uh, and stop the production of cortisol, the stress hormone in the dog's blood. Now, cortisol is, uh, it, it, it basically helps us if we're in a dangerous situation. It shuts down all non-essential body function, so your digestion, and puts all your body's energy towards fight or flight response. It accelerates your breathing, your respiratory, and all the rest of this fun stuff. Um, and so basically, it's helpful in a short period of time because it prepares you to battle, battle someone or run away. But if you're in that state for too long, it can release, uh, it can, that PTSD can kick in. Uh, I laughed first time somebody said a dog can have PTSD. It's the same exact principle. So now here's an interesting thing, and, and I have somebody who actually probably can tell me the last one, but um, your body cannot produce cortisol at the same time it produces oxytocin, serotonin, and leptin, leptin, <laughs> Something along those Go with lines. that, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> um, so uh, if, if, a, if a trainer teaches you how to do this exercise, the goal of this exercise is to get the dog to look you in the face. And a trainer will teach you by going like this. Yeah. Well, I'm luring the dog to look me in the face. The problem with that is it doesn't release oxytocin, serotonin, or the other one no! if you lure the dog. But if the dog voluntarily looks you in the eyes for longer than 11 seconds, it starts releasing oxytocin, serotonin, and leptin, or whatever the third one is, into your blood and, or your brain and the dog's brain and it stops the production of cortisol. So if your dog's in a situation where it's starting to get stressed out, the cortisol is gonna amplify the things that make it worse. This exercise, I'm gonna lure the dog to look away from me, away from my face, and when he looks at my face, that's when he's gonna get the treat. Now I'm gonna raise it to my nose in a way, all right, I know you're impatient, all right. So it doesn't have to sit. I have a handful of treats here in my left hand, and I have one treat in my right hand. I'm watching his eyes like a hawk. The only thing that he can do to get the treat is to look me in the face. That's why you want to look in the eyes of the hawk, like a hawk. He didn't have to look, lift his whole head. All he has to do is an eye dart. And as soon as he does, I'm going to raise it to my nose and then go straight from my nose to his nose. My nose might be bigger than his. Now, it's very normal for dogs to lick, 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 lick. So what I'm doing is I'm pressing it against my uh, knee as well as holding it with two fingers. So it's like hard. He can lick a tiny little bit of it, but he can't really access it. So it's very normal for dogs to try to take this on their own and just make it happen. Well, part of this exercise is when you don't know what to do, look up at the human for guidance. And so I'm just waiting, and this is a little bit longer than normal, but that's okay. And so as soon as he gives up and looks at me, I'm going to raise my nose in one second movement, and I'm going to go from my nose to his mouth in another one second movement. Now, sometimes I'll cheat a little bit. I'm going to try not to do that, but if I have to, I'm probably going to look, going to look right here. I sometimes will blow but you don't want to say the dog's name or sound to get them to look up at you. We want them to accidentally do this. This is really operant conditioning. But you're very determined. <laughs> that determination can be a good thing. The focus usually works against us. The dog is focused on everything but us. So this exercise taps into it and helps you learn how to teach your dog to focus on you, and you're going to sign a command word of the, uh, I like to say the word focus, and that way it becomes a powerful way to redirect your dog's attention and to call its attention to you when you need to. focus. Ah. So it took a little patience. Now I reload right again so he knows we're still playing the game. And what we should see as we practice this is him looking at me faster and faster. Now when you're doing this, make sure you look at the dog's eyes, uh, like I said, like a hawk. Don't look up because that one time that you look away, they might look at you. And if you miss it, it might be five minutes before they try to look up at you again. Determination is a good thing. Focus. And always say the tree, the name after the treat goes in the mouth. Okay. You see, you saw he SIT'd there. I didn't tell him to. That puts him a little bit of a disadvantage, but lets me know that he thinks he's going to be here for a minute. Now, the other benefit of this, I just did this with a client yesterday. Their dog is eye contact dominant. And so if you love the, the dog likes you and lo, uh, looks you in the eye, it's almost akin to a kiss. If the dog doesn't know the person and uh, the person looks him in the eye, that's a challenge. 
And so we do this exercise sometimes with dogs that react when people look them in the face because that's a nice way to condition them that looking at the human and a human looking in the eyes is actually a good thing where in the animal world that's often a challenge. Focus. So you raise at your nose because you want to maintain the looking at your face. And then you go straight line. And when you do it, I want you to, this next time, I want you to watch my palm. I'm going to have my fingers pointing up and then my palm is going to be facing the dog the whole time. And it's almost like he's objectifying the treat if he's looking at us like pretty girls are like, my face is up here. It's the same sort of principle. He's grumbling and growling. Yeah. Yes. So fingers up, palm facing him, focus. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, when they do it, they go like, and they twist their arm, and now mm -hmm. see where he's looking? He's looking at my knees. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure he, the idea is to eventually prolong and elongate the looking at you in the face. Mm -hmm. Focus. All right, so if, first is one second up, one second down. Don't hold it at the end of your nose, and I'll show you what the last move is going to look. I'll try. One second. Focus. So eventually you want to get to the point where there's a 15 second delay between from your nose to his mouth. Mm -hmm. So um, when I do this, I have usually this with about 12 treats, and I do all 12 treats at the same interval. So one second up, one second down. He's a character. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. Focus. So you do that for all 12 treats, and the next time the person does it, they go maybe, if he's, if he's pretty much staring at you the whole time, then you go one second up and then two seconds from your nose to his face for all 12 treats. And then three seconds and so on. Now, it's not necessarily a jump of one second each time. It's based on the dog's performance. One dog might perform at a different level than the other. Focus. Also, don't practice it just here. Dogs don't generalize well. You have to practice a whole lot of different areas mm -hmm. for dogs to really have it down. Otherwise, they'll just do it only here. Mm -hmm. So the idea is once we get to the point, and you want to get to this point within seven days, where the dog can look you in the face for 15 seconds, mm -hmm. then you want to go and do it outside in your backyard, but not when anybody's out there or there's any distractions. There's automatically distractions, the sight, sounds, and smells of being outside. But you don't know if there's a lawnmower or a leaf blower or something like that because that's just too easy for him to lose focus. Now he knows how to do this at this point, but this is a more challenging situation. So we make it easier. So we go maybe one second, one second for three treats, and one second, two seconds for three treats, and one second, three seconds for treat, three treats, whatever your interval. But you want to get to within the house seven seconds, uh, seven days, because they'll get bored of this exercise. So don't delay it. Make sure you do it every day, a couple times a day, each one of you, with each dog. And I would take one of you upstairs, one of you downstairs, and practice at the same time with the dogs separately. Yeah. Um, and then do this outside. And when one who's inside practices while the other one's outside, you want to within two second, uh, two days outside to be able to get to that 15 second focus. The okay. next stage is to do it when you're on a walk. So now I'm walking down the street, and let's say the dog's walking next to me here, and there's nobody around, there's no dogs, there's no reason for him to be distracted or dis uh, disgruntled in any way. I just say focus. Now I'm saying it verbally. Before I'm waiting for him to look at me and rewarding him for the action. Now I'm giving a verbal cue. Because now we've done enough practice, he should say, focus, he looks up at you. So now, while I continue walking, I say, focus, he looks up at me, and I go, one, boom, one second, one second. Mm -hmm. I know. And then, uh, I, and then eventually the same thing, where and eventually it's two seconds. And eventually it's like he's running into stuff because he's walking for 15 seconds looking up at you as opposed to the people that he's mm -hmm. approaching. So once you got to this point, <clears throat> now you can say, if he, if he hears something, you say, focus, and he looks at you. Now, once they're, once they're reactive, that's essentially hysterical, you're not going to listen to them. You might have to move them away physically or do something else. But the idea is, let's say that you're sitting here and you see somebody's, the mailman's walking up. Well, then I might say, start doing the focus exercise while the mailman's coming up, and then the dog starts to uh, ignore, learn to ignore that. Now, again, it's dependent on the intensity of that. Right here, there's probably no way that a mail carrier could come up with him reacting. But if I'm over by your breakfast nook, that's the distance... It lowers the intensity of the reaction. Now, uh, one other little thing that I, uh, I'm going to give you a little bonus tip for this one. Um, uh, she was mentioning that uh, reactive to kids and 
thought is maybe eventually we'll have kids as part of the group. Mm -hmm. So what I do is sometimes something called counter conditioning. So what I do is I find like a playground when there is a bunch of kids that are gonna be playing in a park, somewhere that you have a nice big open area. So you walk and you get as close as you can to the playground, but my two tested, can I get the dog to sit and will the dog take a treat? If it won't take the treat or won't sit, you're, it's so close, I'm about ready to go hysterical. So you back up far enough away where the dog will sit and take the treat and see the kids. Then what I do is I take a treat like this and I squish it so it's flat like a pancake. Now I can let the dog chew on it and I can have him looking wherever I want just by moving the treat mm -hmm. up and down to the side. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is if the playground is over here is I smash the treat and I have him looking at the kids while he's chewing on the treat. So now he's having something positive happen while he's looking at the kids but the kids are far enough away he doesn't perceive it to be a, a threat. Mm -hmm. Let's say we're at 25 paces. So we do this until you know, you do a five or you know, 10 times in a row and he's feeling comfortable. Then I, and it'd be even better if you could have a kid that helps you. You can go to a playground if you don't know anybody. If you have any friends with kids, mm -hmm. what you can do, and let me know, because actually one of my, pe uh, one of my puppy class instructors teaches pre-K. Oh, no. um, so an ideal situation would be to have, let's say the, over there where the plant is, I have the dog, come here buddy, facing that way and I have the kid in on it with me. Mm -hmm. Say, okay, as soon as I start giving this to the dog, I want you to start walking that way. So as the dog, the child walks, he's tracking, mm -hmm. and, then, and he's, and as soon as the treat is about to go away, I say stop, and the child freezes, and then I pull the treat away. So the only time that I, I get the treat is when the thing that I don't want happening is happening. The child is moving. Mm -hmm. So at first the child's just walking slowly back and forth. Then you have them move faster, faster, faster. Eventually they're running, and the dog is conditioned to now not respond to that because a, a positive thing is happening. Mm -hmm. So then what I would do is have the person well. Actually, well, I'll give you the official way. So once what, I, I would really maybe do the, uh, the treat when the, having him watch until I get to the point where he's running. At that point, then I would take the treat away and I would say, okay, Bobby, I want you to run that direction now five paces or maybe just two paces at first. So Bobby takes two sudden steps and the dog sees it, then I give him the treat. Mm -hmm. So we do the treat while he's looking at it to get him kind of used to and comfortable with it, but then we want to flip it. So now the child moving means instead of being something to bark at, you should be happy because the child moving means you're about to get a treat. So eventually it gets to the point where Bobby can run 15 paces back and forth and then he gets a treat afterward and there's no peep out of your dog. We're at 25 paces, then we have the child or we move one closer, step closer, now we're at 24 paces. Well, you keep on practice and eventually you get 22, 21. We get to 21, he barely will take the treat and barely will sit down. We're getting close to his breaking point, so we stop and then we say, Bobby, thanks a bunch. Bobby's mom takes him home. We go home, and the next day, like, let's say we're at 19. Next time we practice, we start at 19 or 20. And gradually collapse that distance mm. until Bobby can be mm. running circles around the dog. And the dog's like, Bobby runs a circle, I get a treat. Bobby runs a circle, <laughs> I get a treat. So now we helped create, we counter conditioned the dog to not be reactive to that. Mm. I would focus on this focus exercise I went over first. But like I said, if you, there's a playground or not, or if you have somebody that has a kid, that can help you out with that. The, the kid's got to actually be able to cooperate. If he keeps on running when you stop doing a treat, that'll that's sure. kind of backfires. Yeah. Here, buddy. Can we come over here? It, it's better for people if they. I would think they would appreciate seeing your face instead of your butt. So that little twitch, that's the cortisol. Yeah. yeah. Sit. Well, this is Herman, and this, these are tips and tricks that I can teach a dog to focus in a way that reduces their stress.